the Southern Cascades, which is, you know, Shasta area, Lassen area, to the Sierras, um, which Southern Sierra stuff and Northern Sierra stuff is really similar. It's just the elevation is a little bit different because, you know, the fur zone here is 4,000 or so. The fur zone down south is about 6,000. Um, so it's just, you know, you just have to go higher up as you go further south to get the same mushrooms. And then the California, San Bernardino, San Gabriel Mountains, which there's not very many mushrooms in, but there's a mix of Sierra stuff there in southwest, you know, New Mexico, Arizona species in that area. So, of course, a lot of you probably know where this is, uh, Yosemite, on the way into the valley. Uh, so the Sierras have a lot of granite, a lot of rocky areas. Um, so it's a really different geology, you know, I, I don't know a lot about geology of the, you know, the California mountains, but it was really like formed differently than the Cascade Range, which is mostly volcanic. So you get a lot of volcanic sands and, and you know, pumice stone lava and stuff in the northern mountains that don't occur in the Sierras. And then that whole Siskiyou Knot mess, um, there's a lot of serpentine over there. So there's a lot of like, for mushroom habitat, really barren areas. Um, but the Sierras have two really distinct seasons. They have a spring season that occurs after the snow melt and a fall season if you get rains that aren't snow. And you also occasionally, you know, scattered spots, you'll get summer thunderstorms and you'll get a mushroom season from those. But that's really patchy. So more of, I mean, I, I've probably been to Yosemite five or six times, maybe more, um, and I, you know, rarely look out there. You know, I just watch them all the time. <laughs> and usually when I go, I do a lot of spring stuff there. And this is kind of what I'm looking for. So this is a phenomenon that only happens in the western mountains, and that's these snowmelt species. So you get these snow banks that start receding, and in this area, you know, this is probably about four feet up the tree, so you can usually tell, you know, the wolf lichen does not survive covered with snow. So you can usually tell the snowpack area, the normal snowpack area, based on the, the zone where the lichens start disappearing on the trees. Um, so California mountains, as a lot of you know, they're extremely hot and dry in the summer. Mushrooms can't take hot and dry, but they, they get a lot of moisture from snow melt. So when that snow starts melting, you start getting a lot of mushrooms using that moisture to fruit. And so with, with the, the California mountains have all these snow melt dependent species, which can produce enough heat to melt the snow to come up through it. So this is, like I said, this only happens in Western North American mountains, and the majority of the species occur in the Southern Cascades and the Sierras. There's a few which make it over to the Rocky Mountains, but not nearly as many here. And there's some stuff in the, the Northern Cascades of Washington up into you know, British Columbia, but not nearly the species diversity that occurs here. And the primary reason for that is stuff had to do that here because it got so hot and dry. If you didn't fruit with that snowmelt moisture, you weren't going to fruit. And if you don't fruit, you don't produce the spores. You don't produce the spores, you don't survive. So this is probably the most common one, Clytospis glacialis. You can have hundreds of these things in the melting snow banks. This little, um, this little black cup fungus probably produces the most heat of any of these things. I've seen them coming up through a few inches of ice. You know, so they, they produce enough heat to melt that ice to put that fruit body up. Um, this Mycena fruits in these really large clusters. It starts when it's completely covered with snow. And by the time it's like uncovered, um, or you know, snow's melted from that area, it's gone. How big is this? Um, this gets about to two inches across. It's a really large mycena. Where does the heat come from? It produces it. Oh. So you know, it's it, it probably you know, it's producing it. There's some plants that do this too. Skunk cabbage, um, which you know blooms in the east coast and like late february early march has the ability to melt snow around it to produce yeah. it to, you know to put the flower up and, and start blooming really early um this one here this foliota and this has happened so this has evolved in many different groups these are as you see these are really unrelated fungi so you know both gill fungi and ascomycetes um 
you know, white sports stuff, dark sports stuff, then this has also happened. So not only does this thing fruit the melting snow, it's also, as you see, this, this blob on a stalk. So this is what's called a Sakoshioid mushroom. This is a mushroom that requires something to eat it to spread its spores. So it's lost the ability to forcefully discharge spores. Um, so it's like it's on its way to becoming a truffle. Now, why would a mushroom want to do that? Protect Dry. Dry. Exactly. Exactly. So, so here we have this snow melt moisture. We have a lot of moisture going into the ground, but the surface <coughs> dries up very quickly. And so as it's drying up, you know, mushrooms that are on the surface dry up just as quickly. You know, so like this mycena, like I said, two days after the snow's gone, it's pretty much gone. You're not even going to see signs of it. It goes that quickly. Um, so this mushroom here, which is pretty closely related to this one, has adopted this new strategy. You know, stay contained, conserve moisture, sit there, wait for something to eat you to spread your spores. It's, it's a feature that, that, you know, there's a lot of hypogeous underground fungi in the California mountains which have gone underground, um, you know, mostly because of environmental pressures. And if you eat those? Sometimes. Uh, I wouldn't. <laughs> they smell, so this one smells like um, toilet bowl, wintergreen toilet bowl cleaner, so really like chemical wintergreen flavor. <laughs> okay, so you have to get a lot of morels in the California mountains in the spring. Of course, the forest fire morels, after a burn, you go out, you know, the next year you go out there and yes, there's spots in the ground that just be littered with morels. Of course, there's political reasonings to keep you from picking them, as we saw in the rim fire last year. Um, but, you know, the, if you can make it, you know, smaller forest fires which nobody pays much attention to, or slash pile burns from logging, you can get a lot of morels in a really small area. Or you can hunt the, the, the natural morels here. So this is one of the mountain blonde morel. It's not a true yellow morel or blonde morel. It's a black morel, so it's a false blonde morel. It's just a pale colored black morel. And the main way you can tell the difference between black morels and, and um, yellow morels or blonde morels is all the black morels have this little groove uh, attachment point and all the true yellow morels attach directly to the stalk. So this is just a, you know, an abnormal black morel. Uh, but it's called the mountain blonde morel but in the commercial harvest trade. Um, the natural black morel, much of Snyder eye, is is more of a like triangular shape, large. This is what often gets referred to as the stuffer morels, because you can get morels that are like half pound each, you know, like softball size. And then you get a lot of these little black bird morels. Uh, so you know, the spring following for, forest fire, you can see the little um, seedlings coming up after that burn. You can just get a lot of these morels as a whole are really easy to recognize because the honeycomb-like cap, the single hollow chamber right through the stalk, up through the cap, and false morels are like got a brain, you know, irregular convoluted brain-like cap and, and multi-chambered interior. So this is your spring king. This one fruits uh, about two to three weeks following, you know, after snow melt under ponderosa pine and true firs in the California mountains. Um, so you have at least Rex varus, once again, really easy to recognize by these like pinkish to orangish to you know reddish brown cap color, creamy pores when young becoming that yellowish color, and then this this fishnet called reticulation on the stem, white flesh not staining. Excellent edible, probably the best of the porcini in California. And this is one of the, um, the it's the mountain butter bolete, a spring butter bolete, which butter bolets have the yellow flesh, a little bit of blue staining on the pores, maybe a little bit of blue staining in the flesh. And then there's red cap ones and there's brown cap ones. What does that red and blue? They're all edible. All the butter bullets are edible. Mm -hmm. The ones you want to stay away from are the red port ones that stay blue. And then there's there's the bitter bullets which occur here as well, but um, they have really pale whitish flesh that stains blue really quickly and a really bitter taste. So one of the, the one of the thing, different things about hunting in the California mountains is you have to look for this. So a lot of the mushrooms here don't break the surface until they're mature, and the main reason for that is moisture conservation. Um, you know, if you've had that big elaborate fruit body up above ground, it's going to dry up really quickly. So if you just start 
um, underground and then grow up, it's a lot easier to survive. So this is a, you know, a, probably like a baseball sized bully button, which all you see is that little bump and crack, you unearth it and there's the mushroom. So there's a lot of mushrooms hunting. And so if you don't feel like bending over every time you see some pushed up stuff, um, the trick is to start kicking these bumps. And so if you kick it and your foot goes right through, it's just needles. If you kick it and you stub your toe and it's painful, it's a stump or a log. <laughs> if you kick it and you have like a little bit of kick, you know, real rubbery kickback, it's a bully. Um, so <laughs> that's what you normally see. You see this little bit of pushed up earth. This one's actually a little bit uncovered. When you start digging at it, there's your mushroom. Here's another, this is the large Romeria, when all you see is just a little bit of pushed up earth. If it takes some time to get to, you know, to, to learn how to hunt mushrooms in the California mountains. It's not easy. So here's a big giant amanita that is just this little teeny pushed up dust. And sometimes these really big mushrooms will be almost nothing. And sometimes these tiny little corn areas will push up like a foot of, you know, duff all up. And you'll think, ah, bullets, and you'll unearth it and just be a little, little, little brown mushroom. And a lot of, like I said earlier, a lot of hypogea fungi. So this is closely related to Romeria, that coral fungus right here, uh, but it's completely underground now. And it's lost all its branches. It's just become this little blob. This one here is related to Hepaloma, um, which is a brown spore gilled mushroom, but now, as you see, it's just this truffle. Um, and then this one here is related to stink horns. So there's a lot of different truffles around here, um, hundreds and hundreds of species. But very few of them are, are of culinary value. All right, this is going to be a really brief section. <laughs>